Let's try it again. Obstetrics and childbirth, chapter 33, taking chapters out of order today, and that's all right. Uh, most deliveries occur in the hospital, unless I was around, and it seemed like if there was a baby, baby that it hit its due date, then I was going to deliver a baby. I don't, that's the way EMS works. It just seems like cert, pe certain people always are dispatched on certain calls, and for me, one of the biggies was childbirth. I knew people who never delivered a baby in the time that I worked with them in the field, and it seemed like it. I always had strange OB calls, and and I thought complicated OB calls, and I, I mean, you have sort of you have now you have flight paramedics and critical care paramedics, and I I think I should be grandfathered and be the first. OBGYN paramedic, but all right, let's see. So what are, what are our decisions? Our big decision is do we want to deliver this baby where we are or transport the patient to the hospital? We'll add a third category. If the baby starts to deliver en route to the hospital, we pull over and deliver a baby. That's, we don't deliver a baby bouncing down the road. They're slimy little boogers. I did that once just because the baby delivered in, in inside the amniotic sac and while we were going down 9th Street right in front of where AC Allied Health Building is. And that was that was fun. Okay, you guys know the, the pieces, parts of the female reproductive system, and you know how that baby comes to be inside the uterus. So we'll go on past that. We're going to bounce through this summary and uh, this is almost the same summary that's already up on uh, on Blackboard for you. Uh, developing fetus is it develops within the amniotic sac and it essentially floats in in amniotic fluid, that's a cushion that protects the baby, the umbilical cord connects the mother's circulation to the placenta and the baby, I mean, well, yeah, mother's circulation is connected to the placenta. Baby's connected to the placenta with the umbilical cord. I should explain that a little better than I did. All right. Did I mess anybody up there? I don't think so. That's okay. Uh, contractions cause the baby to deliver throughout pregnancy. Body changes to accommodate the fetus. We've all seen pregnant women. Many of us have have had pregnant wives or significant others, and we have witnessed the tremendous changes that a woman's body undergoes over the course of a pregnancy. I say if anybody needs evidence of the existence of God, watch that and then watch the baby be born and look on your kid and say, wow, I don't think that, I don't think that started with an amoeba. Okay. And the big changes, uh, there, there, there are lots of minor changes, but big changes over the course of pregnancy, mom's changes, respiratory changes, of course, baby changes a lot from being two separate cells that merge into one cell and then grow into a kid. But mom's changes, uh, respiratory, cardiovascular, and, and then some musculoskeletal changes. Uh, respiratory changes as the fetus grows the the uterus is displaced from mom's pelvis and begins to push up into it push up on and encroach into the abdomen so the the peritoneum remains the peritoneum, but there's there's pressure. There's pressure on mom's bladder. 
there's pressure pushing on the, the peritoneum and as the abdominal contents within the, the peritoneal sac are compressed, compressed upward, that pushes on the diaphragm and that decreases the amount of tidal volume of the mother. Uh, so what ch your book is a bit misleading right here because it says and decreasing minute volumes. It should say because of decreasing minute volumes. So, and I'll change this on this slide in the future, but I usually blast through this and I, I just caught this today. So let's say respiratory capacity changes causing decreased minute volumes and, and the pregnant woman compensates with increased respiratory rate to maintain adequate minute volume. That makes sense? Okay, so, so tidal volume is decreased. There's still large oxygen, oxygen demand required. So just like with any other decrease in tidal volume that we've talked about the whole semester, the body's compensatory change is to increase respiratory rate to maintain minute volume. So that's all that's happening there. No, it's another amazing process. But it's not surprising that blood volume increases by up to 50% for a couple of reasons. Uh, we have, and there, there are more than this, this will be enough for today. Mom's blood supply has to perfuse the placenta so that the placenta can perfuse the baby. So that there's an increased blood supply demand there. And then mom's gonna need extra blood volume during and after delivery because there's going to be considerable blood loss there. So that's the reason for up to 50% increase in blood volume. So that can be, depending on the size of mom, there's a formula there we'll teach you in the advanced program. But the whole semester we've used six liters as average adult total circulating blood volume. So if that's the case, add three liters. That's that's a lot of fluid. Heart rate, heart rate increases up to 20% uh, have increased perfusion and requirements. Uh, stroke volume can only increase so much. So if there's additional perfusion required, the increase in heart rate is, is the mechanism to, to, uh, to bring that about. There's a word for bring that about and I couldn't grab it this morning, sorry. And there's a hormone that is produced several different places in the body. The placenta is one of them. And that hormone called relaxin causes the joints to loosen, the, the, lig the ligaments to loosen up a little bit in, throughout the body. The, the, the primary place that, that the body needs ligaments to loosen is the pubic symphysis. That has to expand over the course of the pregnancy and, and then has to be forced apart considerably during, birth, during childbirth. So that's, that's the primary focus of this hormone, but we know that medications and hormones have systemic effects and Systemic effects uh, are the sacroiliac joints, which are semi-fused joints. They become more loose. The ligaments that uh, that connect the the vertebra that stack stack up 
those become somewhat loose, so spinal alignment becomes a pro can become a problem, and sacroiliac hypermobility of the sacroiliac joints becomes a problem, and that causes pain, and that causes instability in the knees. the The ligaments in the knees loosen up, and and ligaments in the feet. And you combine that with a change in mom's center of gravity so that rather than being axial and more in line with the, with the trunk of the body, the center of gravity extends out. And that in the third trimester causes moms to, to have a higher risk of fall. First stage of labor begins with, with the onset of contraction and ends when the cervix is fully dilated. The cervix is the inferior portion of the, just where the, the, where the uterus connects to the vagina is, is the cervix. The cervix is normally very tight. It's normally uh, takes surgical instrument to open that up for a gynecological procedure, but uh, the cervix begins to dilate uh, it during labor. And normally a fully dilated cervix is 10 centimeters. Uh, hence my phrase, squeezing a, a watermelon through a garden hose is what childbirth is. Okay. Second stage begins with complete dilation of the cervix and ends with birth of the infant. Registry sometimes likes to likes to test, ask a question or two on these stages of labor. Sometimes you get very little uh, childbirth. You just you don't know. Third stage of labor begins with the birth of the infant, ends with the delivery of the placenta. In our world, once labor has begun, we can't stop it. Uh, premature labor in, a, in the hospital, they can use an IV drip of hormones to, or, or IV push of medication, not hormones, IV push of medication or an IV drip of medication to stop labor, uh, terbutaline. We also use terb terbutaline for uh, respiratory emergencies in the paramedic world, but it's uh, it's used in the in the hospital setting to stop premature labor. But in our labor, in our labor, once in our world, once once labor starts, the first stage of labor has begun, and we can't stop it. Second stage, and we can transport mom in that first stage. Uh, we can transport mom and and there's no problem. Second stage of labor. Now here's a here's a problem. What did I say when what did I say ends the first stage and begins the second stage? It's full cervical dilation. I'm gonna tell you in a few minutes that that we don't insert our fingers in mom's vagina to to determine how dilated her cervix is. And so that there's, I think this is somewhat misleading, but uh, we'll, I'll, I'll give you a way to clear it up here in a second. So what decides really is going to decide whether you're going to stay and deliver a kid or whether you're going to transport practically, that is if you see crowning. If you see crowning, we're not going anywhere till we've delivered a baby. All right, so that, and that's, I mean, you're talking, they call it engage. So once the head engages and starts through the cervix and, and it takes, it takes some contractions to finally move that baby down so that that head's crowning and you see that, that bulge in the, in mom's vagina and perineal area, just the, that head pushing. And then a, a contraction ends and mom and the 
the baby's head moves back some, even though you can still see it. Then the next contraction, you have mom push, 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 and eventually you're going to get that head through. But if you see, if you see crowning, not all babies have hair, but if you see, if you see at the top of a of a hairy head or a bald head, which would look like mine since we don't have video, that's that's how I started this life was with with a bald head, and it didn't take me long to come back around. Okay, so if you see crowning, we're going to deliver a baby. Third stage of labor, your book's wrong about part of this. We're going to talk about what the book says, and I'm going to tell you what happens in the world. No, third stage of labor, after you deliver the infant, third stage begins. This says you will probably not transport the patient until the placenta has been delivered. You have a bunch of stuff to do once baby is born. Number one, you have to take care of baby and mom at the same time. That is one reason we pull over because we need two folks to take care of these, at least the first 10 minutes after you've delivered this baby probably. So that's, let me check this texture. Oh, okay. So once, uh, You, you need two sets of hands, at least, maybe more, but it, you need to, you need two people to make sure that, that, because I'm going to tell you we, later, I'm going to, at least I'm going to suggest that it's a good idea to try to go about two minutes before you cut the cord, depending on what your protocol says, but it's, it's very beneficial to to that that neonate to get a couple of more minutes of of circulation I'll show you why later and then uh, you have to you have to then cut the cord you had to suction baby out as baby was being born with the bulb syringe then you have to suction baby again make sure you're keeping that airway clean make sure you have a, a an, ups, an upset crying newborn. Uh, you stimulate them, make them cry. We don't hold them upside down and slap them on the feet like the old movies, but uh, rub them with a towel. We're going to be drying them off anyway. Rubbing the baby's back with a, with a towel is that's a great way to stimulate one that's that's not not picking up quick enough. And placing baby on mom's chest and we need to note the time of the delivery. That's that goes on the birth certificate that you're going to sign if you deliver the baby. And then, and then one minute later, we're going to do, do an app APGAR score. We'll talk about APGAR scoring later. And then, at five minutes after the the time of birth, we're going to get a five minute APGAR. Those are really important. Uh, in really those are important in predicting how the child's going to develop cognitively uh, and uh, somewhat in physical development. And that gives, those are a, an indispensable starting point for the pediatrician in managing that baby uh, through, especially through infancy, which would be the first year of life. So uh, very, those are three very important things you need to do. Note those times. Uh, okay. Complications of pregnancy. Hypertensive disorders, that would be preeclampsia, and eclampsia, we'll nail down in a minute what those are. Vaginal bleeding and gestational diabetes. You knew this before you came here too. If you have a trauma call that involves a pregnant woman, you have two patients to consider. Yeah, that's, boy, my dog knows that, but she can't talk. All right, she can't write very well and she can't type, but she knows that. I can see it in her eyes, she knows. Pregnant woman, you have two patients. To at least two, right? Could be more. Uh, that's part of our patient history is 
have you had prenatal care and have you been told there's a chance you have multiple multiple babies growing in there okay uh, so any trauma to the woman will have an effect on the condition of the fetus we can't directly treat the fetus we have to focus our management on mom and do everything we can to treat mom so that the fetus in turn is treated. Complicated deliveries, breach deliveries, that can be a frank breach, which is a buttock presentation. Our book separates limb presentation from breach deliveries, which means that's a national standard. Around a hospital, you'll call, hear them talk about a footling breach or a frank breach, but your book uses breach deliveries, limb presentations, and then uh, prolapse of the umbilical cord, where the umbilical cord is the presenting part. I have a picture of that later, and I'll tell you how to manage that. A patient with any of those three requires priority transport, uh, not necessarily ALS, but maybe if you need somebody more experienced, then that's not a bad thing to call for ALS to intercept you on the way. Uh, the only time we place finger or hand into the vagina is only times, I'm going to say, uh, to move the, the vaginal walls away from the infant's airway in a breech presentation because we can't feel the cord to see if it's still pulsing. So we don't know if baby is, is being perfused or not. So we have to, we have to, we have to take care of, of perfusion the best we can and the old way, and this means mom doesn't have seat belts around her, was to put mom in the knee chest position and you're behind mom with two, two fingers in the vagina pulling down to form a V around, around baby's mouth and nose. So you're reaching up from behind, you're supporting the baby with one hand and then pulling down, downward with the other to, to open up the baby's airway. And if your partner can get to it, suction out am not amniotic fluid. At the same time, that's a lot happening in a real, a real close area. So it may be difficult to do that, especially if you're already in the back of your ambulance. The way your book teaches is to place mom in the left lateral recumbent position so she's on the stretcher on her left side and you're supporting the top leg upward. So probably mom's leg is, her lower leg is resting on your shoulder or maybe right at her knee. And then you're inserting fingers to make that airway. I don't care which way you do it. Registry is left lateral recumbent position. I like to teach the other because it's so much easier. It's just, and if we're, we're not going to be going down the road doing this, we're going to be pulled over or we're going to be in somebody's living room. The first baby I delivered was on the floor of a grave marker company. A lady went across to use the phone and, and we walked through the door and she was crowning. He was yelling, get her off, not yelling, but he was ex excitedly saying, get her off my floor, get her off my floor. And I had a baby to deliver before I moved her. So he had entered the world on the, on the floor of a, of Osgood monument company over by Lano cemetery. Okay. Uh, you have to push the infant's head away from the cord uh, when the cords prolapse. So you have, the the cord is looped out and the head's compressing it so you can use the palm of your hand to push the baby back i just covered the camera so you couldn't see it all but or 
we can put mom in the left lateral recumbent position, insert two fingers. How would you know whether they're still, whether baby's still being perfused through the umbilical cord at that point? You can feel a pulse in the umbilical cord. So that's how you know if you're doing what you need to to decompress that cord. You could also put mom in that knee chest position, but that's the old way. I think it's a more efficient way, but no seat belts, so that's a problem. Okay, excessive vaginal bleeding. That's a giddy up and go emergency. Cover the vagina with a sterile pad. Vaginal bleeding is the only time that we ever remove a pad and re remove a dressing and add another. That's because the bleeding's internal and so we're not we're not pulling away the coagulation that's taking place and then pull the clot away and and start all over that's not what is happening with vaginal bleeding the bleeding's internal and we're just catching blood with pads it'll help estimate the amount of blood loss at the hospital uh, those big pads hold at least 15 milliliters of blood. I, I have had as many as 10 of them totally saturated during transport, and I'm talking like a 10 minute code three transport. It's a bad, bad deal. That's all, that's all my firemen did all the way to the hospital. Okay. Uh, important things to note, here, uh, this is a picture from your book, but the placenta usually develops up toward the fundus or the top of the uterus or somewhere on the sides. We're going to talk about placenta previa later. That's when the placenta from up here develops down at the on the distal end of the cervix and can cover the can it can completely cover the cervix baby's only way in, into the world is through the placenta and that causes masses of massive amount of bleeding so we'll talk more about that in a few minutes uh okay Breast produced milk uh, that's carried through small ducts in the nipple to provide nourishment for the baby. Uh, here we see a placenta that's formed on the side. Uh, that's that perfuses and nourishes the baby uh, through the umbilical cord. I have a picture of umbilical cord in a minute, and it will make sense then. It wouldn't that much now. Okay, there are many substances that don't pass between mom and, and the fetus that uh, and others do. Uh, there are very few medications that a pregnant woman can can take because almost all of them will will pass that placental barrier into the baby and can cause just tremendous birth defects depending on the medicine. Uh, there's an acne medicine called Accutane and when it was first used, I guess nobody thought about teenagers getting pregnant because it's Accutane works great on, on teenage acne and the the young ladies who became pregnant while they were on Accutane, those babies had horrendous birth def defects to the point that for for several years there was a form that that a dermatologist would have the parents sign stating that 
there were all these horrible birth defects, then it still happened. I, apparently teenagers hang out with their, with one another on occasion and that produces a child. So then it, it moved to requiring a negative pregnancy test. Well, that doesn't do anything down the road. Currently for last I knew if, as, and that's provided Accutane is still even FDA approved, but the current standard of care is a pregnant woman or, or no, a, a, a non-pregnant teenage girl who, who is going to be placed on Accutane, even if they've already signed the, signed the contract to go to the convent and be a nun, they, that's not real. That was a joke. We could laugh at that in class, but not here. Uh, no matter how much they promise that they will not be sexually active until they're married, or at least till after they're no longer taking Accutane, they have to be on birth control throughout and provide proof to the dermatologist that they that they're continuing to fill that medication. So it's, there are medications that are great, big deal. I, and then there are, uh, let's throw alcohol and street drugs in with that. And those can have profound effects on a developing fetus. Okay. Uh, umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus. And the umbilical arteries carry deoxygenated blood from the fetus back to the placenta. So you have, and in the paramedic world, we, we teach, uh, it's an advanced skill, but we teach paramedics to insert umbil umbilical venous catheters into neonates uh, who, who require resuscitation and medications and one way to do that is that is the umbilical vein and we just teach them to get a clean cut on the cord on the baby side and then look so you see two eyes and a mouth which we see here and the uh, the uvc umbilical venous cord goes in the mouth okay not the baby's mouth that mouth right there okay uh, 500 to 1,000 mils of amniotic fluid in the amniotic sac. We've talked already about these, what, three changes, three major systems undergo changes. Uh, everything is, is driven by hormone level increases, the changes in mom's body and the and the feedback feedback within the endocrine endocrine system, uh, and it's all geared toward preparing mom's body for childbirth. The further the pregnancy progresses, the higher mom's risk is uh, for major bleeding from trauma and bleeding from some medical conditions. I've already talked about how the uterus starts to to encroach on, on into the abdominal cavity and starts to compress that peritoneal sac. We'll take a break in about three minutes. Okay, rapid uterine growth in the second trimester. Let me let me exp let me hit something here, and then we'll take a break and go on with this slide. So. There are three trimesters in a pregnancy. And the first trimester begins with the first day of mom's last menstrual period. So when we're getting a history on a pregnant woman, that is a question that we have to ask. What was the date of the beginning of your last menstrual period? That now we have ultrasound dating and we can pretty much nail that down 
retrospectively, but if mom keeps track of things and my wife for our entire marriage kept a little calendar and she, I don't know, she had some system to note the begin the date of the beginning of every menstrual period. And that, that way when almost seven years into our, almost seven years into our marriage, when, when our son was born, she, she could nail down that date the first time she called the doctor. So that, that's, that is an important part of history. So from there, the normal gestation is 36 to 40 weeks. We track everything in weeks as well. So we divide 40 by three, that doesn't work quite as well as 36 by three. So in my mind, in EMS, when's your last known menstrual period? Then I can go 36. I, I can move out in 12 from there and see whether we're in the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. That's just rough work for EMS, that third trimester that actually extends to, it actually extends to 40 weeks, but that's all right. And full term is anywhere between 36 and 40, le 40 weeks. All right, let's, let's pause here, take a five minute break, stretch our legs, and then we will keep on moving here. I've got to pick up some speed, but there's a lot to cover in this dang chapter. It could be a whole day too. Okay, five minutes. Okay, let's see what else we need to hit with this. Okay, we'll just bounce through this. Uh, changes during the, the second trimester, uterus grows and it pushes, we've already explained how it pushes up out of the pelvis and compresses the contents of the peritoneal cavity. And the further you go in the second trimester, the 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 more that that compression happens that decreases that decreases tidal volume because of the pressure on the diaphragm and that so the, and the body increases respiratory rate to maintain minute volume i'll change that slide also uh, Blood volume increases, we already set up to 50%, and speed of clotting increases. That would be important, right? Uh, we have a major need for blood clotting uh, at, the, at the end of this pregnancy. And then cardiac output is increased. Stroke volume remains the same. Heart rate increases to, because th that placenta has to be perfused. So if the, uh, cardiac output goes up because cardiac output, as we said all semester, is stroke volume times heart rate. The heart rate piece is the only one that we can get pre-hospitally. So it's, it's not unusual for a second and third trimester mom to have the heart rate around 100 or a little more. Third trimester increased risk of vomiting, uh, then uh, as potential aspiration becomes a, a problem. Uh, and that's your book lists that with trauma. Uh, occasionally, you, most of the time, mom's nausea and vomiting, if she's going to have it, is early first trimester uh, morning sickness. And that is caused by hormonal changes and uh, some moms have very little, some are in the bed sick. Uh, my wife said that the trick is keep crackers by the bed, wake up, don't get out of bed, eat, the, eat your crackers, stay there and wait a while and then get up because if you get up on an empty stomach, you're going to be sick for the for the whole morning my wife's was day sickness it was every waking moment pretty much and you can't take anything for the nausea so there's there are tricks uh, 
Another one is C band, S E A band. Uh, it's a pressure point thing that they use to control nausea, like on on cruise ships and stuff. You can buy them at Walmart, and they some women say those help. All right, that's for those of you who may need to know later. That's not an EMS thing. That's a maybe you can help somebody, a friend or family member out, or maybe even yourself with with that little advice. Always throw that in there. Third trimester, this is when the, the uterus goes to the gym. Braxton Hicks contractions or false labor are, those are contractions of the uterus. They're disorganized. They're not efficient push a baby out kind of contractions, but the, the uterus is a muscle. It's, and it's, and it, and the body is toning the uterus up to get it ready to deliver a baby. My sister thought the name that Braxton sound because of her Braxton Hicks contractions. She thought she thought Braxton sounded cool enough that I have a nephew with that as a middle name. It just always seems strange to me, but that's sounds sounds cool. If you I don't know, I'm just weird. Now we say weight gain in pregnancy is normal. For years, doctors did not want moms gaining any weight so they had them starve themselves pretty much and take all these extra vitamins you need to take prenatal vitamins anyway especially especially iron for blood building but but they had, just had moms starve themselves because they thought it put old OBGYNs and back in the days when general practitioners delivered babies all the time they thought that it put too much stress on the cardiovascular system of a mom so they didn't want them gaining any weight and they also thought that minimized the stress on the musculoskeletal system now control weight gain there's a chart start with mom's weight and the maximum advisable weight gain and all of that stuff. Uh, this isn't an OBGYN class. But, uh, relaxin, that hormone that I already talked about, uh, it, it's to help the pelvis expand. Uh, that, that back pain and hip pain can even start to show up six to 12 weeks into the pregnancy, uh, but it really, really kicks in in that second and third trimester. Most pregnant women do great. They, they don't require much help from the outside world. If, and if that weren't the case, we would have died out as a species long, long ago. So uh, now the thing that happened, I would say up until oh, 60, 70, maybe 70 years ago, the infant mortality rate as well as the 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 pregnant the the mortality rate of a pregnant woman was extremely high and moms are moms are created to have babies women are created to have babies and if everything goes fine there's no problem but they, we had a lot of, of, pre, of prenatal maternal death as, and, of course, prenatal infant death, but they, they go together. Uh, and they didn't call it fetal death back then. They, they called it infant death, even though the little dude wasn't here yet, or the little chick. We're not supposed to say dude and chick anymore, are we? I think I had that in my, my, my cultural sensitivity type training that I had to do for the college the other day. So don't turn me in. That's on tape now. Oh, well. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I'll do better in the future. Okay. Uh, don't ever withhold oxygen from, from a, a sick, pregnant mom. Oxygen's not going to hurt that fetus. That fetus has to have oxygen. Actually, in most cases, the fetus is going to get what it needs and before mom in some ways, that's kind of crazy. Gestational diabetes is a complication of pregnancy in, uh, you'll see it 
in a, a a pregnant mom who is not normally a diabetic and the stress of the pregnancy causes it's usually more like a type 2 diabetes so it's it's an insulin resistant type diabetes most of the time managed with diet in extreme cases it requires insulin what's the big deal about it uh, well and let's add this 60 percent of gestational diabetics will become type 2 diabetics later in life yeah. my, my old wife is one of those the the big deal is that the the high blood glucose levels over the course of the pregnancy result in an extremely large baby like even with even with the almost perfectly controlled diet and almost perfectly controlled sugars with our our son ended up weighing nine pounds nine ounces born at 38 weeks gestation and our daughter was born on the same on the same day of 38 weeks gestation and she weighed nine pounds two ounces but 12 it, with uncontrolled diets 12 14 pound babies are not uncommon and they it's not many men, women are made to for a vaginal delivery of a 14 pound baby and these babies get in distress then after they're born baby baby was used to having some some help from mom with insulin levels to help control the the fetal blood sugar as baby translates from being a fetus to a neonate babies those babies have trouble controlling their sugars for a while and that so that's it in the hospital you'll see them do lots of blood glucose level checks on those babies and those babies don't like to have their little heels poked because that's where you get blood from a baby to check a bgl and they scream and holler when you do that. Okay, hypertensive disorders, preeclampsia. Uh, after, so this is a complication, preeclampsia is a complication of pregnancy induced hypertension. After 20 weeks gestation, they're always keeping a close eye on protein in mom's urine that's an indicator that preeclampsia may be developing and that if mom starts to so as you're getting a history uh, you need to and as you're doing a physical exam look to see if mom's hands and feet appear to be swollen that's a big time indicator and then ask mom have you had persistent headaches uh, you had a, have you had a bunch of headaches uh, any blurred vision, any floaters in your vision, swelling of the hands and feet. Mom, but you, we get a lot of, in EMS, we get a lot of women who don't have prenatal care. And we see a lot of teenage moms who don't have prenatal care. And they're not real well in tune with everything that's going on with them. They're not having prenatal vision visits at the at the OBGYN and they're dang sure not having their blood pressure checked. So swelling in the hands and feet uh, and headache. And then we need to look for hypertension. So if we have those signs and symptoms, we're in all likelihood dealing with preeclampsia. So preeclampsia, if it's pre, there must be an eclampsia, right? So let's move on. Eclampsia is the result of having preeclampsia that then results in seizures, in mom having seizure activities. And these are generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Tonic-clonic, that's the, the, the jerking, spasming type seizure. So full-blown, uh, generalized seizure uh, what the heck do we do you turn and run out the door right no 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 
uh, if you see this you, in a pregnant woman, you are dealing with the eclampsia. Let's get mom on her in the left lateral recumbent position. We have, we have to maintain a patent airway even in the left lateral recumbent position. And we need to administer supplemental oxygen, positive pressure, pressure ventilation if needed, suction vomit out of the way, and rapid transport. And if ALS is available, call for ALS. Paramedic can give magnesium sulfate, IV push, and that should stop those seizures. Uh, scary thing to see. Uh, I'm an old man now, so everybody who can have a baby is a young woman to me. So uh, it's, it, it is, even as an experienced clinician, it is a stressful thing on the inside. You can't let anybody else see this, but it is a stressful thing inside of your brain to see this happening. It's, it's a scary thing. Uh, those seizures can deprive that fetus of oxygen. That's why we have to work so hard at left lateral recumbent position, maintains perfusion, blood perfusing to the baby, but uh, via fetal circulation. But that doesn't guarantee oxygenation. So I guess I've, blood circulating to the baby. We need to do everything we can to make sure that that is highly oxygenated blood. So maintain that patent airway, suction as needed, and supplemental O2. This is, a, if necessary, I say it's an absolute must. So uh, that's not what your book says. It doesn't say, it says if necessary. I say get a non-rebreather mask on there, have suck on her, have suction ready, call for ALS, and, uh, we, and we have to transport. Another thing your book points out, this, this new in the last two volumes of the book, any seizures in a postpartum woman within six weeks after delivery can be preeclamptic seizures. So mom can have preeclampsia even after the baby is born. It's still a, a function of hypertension. So if mom's had hypertension, headaches, vision problems since delivery, pro probably prior to delivery also, that would tell you that all of this is hormonally driven, right? Because it takes time for mom's hormones to return to normal. You've heard about postpartum depression. Part of that, it, it, it that's, I mean, it should be the happiest time in your life, right? So if the brain's in control, I've got this great baby, I'm taking care of, everything's fantastic. But postpartum depression is caused by, by hormonal imbalances. And that's why you can't just suck it up and go on because it's just someone being hormonally overwhelmed and we guys we need to be sensitive to that and and don't take it personally and then as clinicians don't take it personally but so that six weeks postpartum is and postpartum that begins at delivery and that after baby is born that's that's postpartum preeclampsia uh, and then postpartum eclampsia would be the once the seizures start on the advanced life support side, we can be more aggressive in treating the those seizures. Uh, they can use steroids, blood transfusion. Uh, you can use, uh, uh, oh, good Lord, you can, uh, Valium and Versed. Uh, so reasons to go to paramedic school. You can push more drugs, right? Okay. You can do more things for your patient. And you make like 32 cents an hour more. Okay, uh, pregnant moms, we need to transport in the, in the left lateral recumbent position. So left, this is her left, left of their, the left side of their body, right? Lateral is on their side. Recumbent is flat. So we need to transport them 
if we're on the squad bench, they're facing us on their side, secured with the seat belts. That is to keep the the baby and uterus and the amniotic, all the contents of the uterus from compressing the inferior vena cava. Like I explained the other day, that that can totally tamponade blood flow in the inferior through the inferior vena cava. So blood flow from the lower body, blood venous blood return from the lower body to the right side of the heart is interrupted at the level of the compression. What does that do? That drop that dumps preload. So when preload goes down patient becomes hypotensive because we don't have enough blood entering the right side of the heart, being perfused out to the lungs and returning to the left side of the heart. So then cardiac output goes way down because stroke volume goes down. And when, stro when cardiac output goes down, perfusion goes down. So patient becomes hypotensive and how to and we fix that by not having mom on her back we transport her left lateral recumbent position let's talk about bleeding ectopic pregnancy in the first trimester is primary cause of of spotting and bleeding uh, normally uh, fertilization takes place in the fallopian tube and Oh, wait, I'm going the wrong way. Okay. Uh, okay, you have ovulation here in the ovary, and ovum makes its way out into this proximal end of the fallopian tube. And then somewhere within that fallopian tube is the location of fertilization. Normally, that, that fertilized ovum moves on down into the uterus and implants in the wall of the uterus. With an ectopic pregnancy, sometimes due to scarring from uh, pelvic infl inflammatory disease, occasionally they just don't know why. Uh, no, no, no negative gynecologic history whatsoever, but that fertilized egg implants within the fallopian tube. Those only stretch so far. This is ruptured ectopic pregnancy, leading cause of maternal death in the first trimester. Uh, have hemorrhage following rupture of ectopic pregnancy. Uh, any, so here's another one of those things to burn in your brain. Any, any woman of childbearing age, so that could be as young as 10 or 12, right? Uh, hopefully not that young, but that could be as young as 10 or 12. Any, any woman who has missed a menstrual cycle and complains of sudden sharp pain in the lower abdomen, more likely to be localized in one lower quadrant or the other, we're going to treat them as if they have a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Sometimes it's, it's asymptomatic or they may just uh, complain of some vaginal spotting and lower abdominal cramping. Uh, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, flu-like symptoms, uh, once that ruptures, so that would be, and see those kind of go with, with first trimester morning sickness, right? Nausea, vomiting, maybe some dizziness, flu-like illness. So that's why these are harder to catch. And a lot of times uh, after a woman misses her menstrual period, it'll be maybe eight to 12 weeks before she's seen for the first time by an OBGYN. And that's kind of in that time period when these happen. Once that thing ruptures, 
there's going to be severe abdominal pain, uh, rebound tenderness, rigidity of the abdomen, tachycardia, hypotension. So we're going to have we're going to have signs and symptoms of abdominal bleeding, right? Why? Because it is. So rebound tenderness, abdominal rigidity, tachycardia, hypotension. These women, they die on you pretty fast. It's, uh, there was an admitting, uh, admitting clerk at the ER in my first few years working as a medic. And, and, I, and I ran this call, and it's one of those calls that still almost makes me cry, but I'd known this young lady for a couple of years. She was a bubbly, happy person, always. When she came to get patient information, she was the first one to say hi. When you came through the through the doors, the way things were set up back then, you went right past where the admitting clerks were. She was the first one to say hi to us when we came in, no matter what. Never seemed like she had a bad day, and always talking and happy and and I remember when she came in and told us one day that she and her husband were expecting a baby and she was so excited. It was her first baby. And and one Sunday afternoon, we get a code three call at the station on, on abdominal bleeding. We roll up, go in, and it's her. And she is pale, diaphoretic, abdomen, rigid. She's tachycardic. She's already very hypotensive. Uh, we start start IV, start running IV fluid in, trying to trying to get her pressure up a little bit because that's all we can do and support the airway. And then she coded on the way to the hospital and and died there in the ER. And she had she died of a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And I, the way I the way I remember it, that was the first ruptured ectopic pregnancy that I ran. Uh, sometimes you'll see shoulder tip pain, so I'll move on so I don't cry. Sometimes you'll see shoulder tip pain, and that's going to be down here where the shoulder ends and the armpit begins. It's called shoulder tip pain, and it's a sign that the ectopic pregnancy is starting to cause some internal bleeding. It's when the patient's lying down. It's, a, it's, it's such a, a strange symptom that it's hard for us to ever even run across. If you happen, to, it won't be on the registry. If you happen to see it pre-hospitally, start thinking in the direction of ruptured ectopic pregnancy. What, what they think is happening is that bleeding is starting to it irritates the the peritoneum and that starts to irritate the phrenic nerve which perfuses the diaphragm and then that causes that referred pain there in the right at the edge of the shoulder blade okay that's what one of those looks like so uh that is, see it just blew that thing apart right there. So mom's right is facing you. So the fallopian tube attaches to the uterus right here. I don't know if this is a post hysterectomy picture or if this is a post mortem picture. Uh, I, don't, I know that that this piece of the uterus is not in mom anymore and but and that's the little fetus and the little dude just grew to the point that that tube couldn't handle it anymore and that tube just exploded so that gives you an idea about it gives and I went out and found this picture because I wanted to I want students to see what a catas catastrophic event this is and why it causes so much bleeding. Uh, you'd think maybe a fallopian tube might not bleed that much, and that's kind of, other than seeing my patients, I, I just I always wondered if the, if the tube just ruptures, then why is there so dang much bleeding? But like this one, it just exploded the, that, 
that connection of the fallopian tube and the uterus, and then that uterus is very, very, very vascular. So when that thing blows, there's just tremendous bleeding. So uh, occasionally bowel pain uh, goes with it. Uh, maybe some some dysuria, uh, and then maybe some nausea and vomiting, other gastric upset. Okay, let's move on to another one. Hemorrhage from the vagina that occurs before labor begins is very serious. All right, we can, we need to work, we need to operate on that. That's for, for dang sure, that is a rule. Okay, it could be a sign of a spontaneous abortion, which is also called a miscarriage. Uh, be careful what you, what you say. Most of the time we just say a spontaneous AB. Uh, AB is abbreviation for abortion. Mom doesn't usually know what we're saying. I mean, if we say it, I mean, it's a possible spontaneous AB that is, if we say miscarriage, that is, even if we're saying a potential, that doesn't mean anything to mom. The, 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 the adjective goes away and the, and the noun controls and the noun is miscarriage and the, the psychological impact of that is tremendous and I think that word doesn't need to come from us. And then with a lot of people, abortion, the word abortion has carry is a very powerful word one way or another. But if we say spontaneous AB, that's usually communicates what we're talking about and it kind of lets somebody else have to deal with the emotion that and a lot of times mom knows and she's dead. she's scared to death and we don't need to make that worse. All right, enough of that. Abruptio placenta, that's when the placenta prematurely separates from the wall of the uterus. When does that normally happen? That normally happens in the third stage of labor, right? After baby's already here. This happens when baby's still in utero and something causes, usually trauma, like uh, deceleration causes the placenta to tear away from the uterine wall. And mom feels, most often will tell you that they feel just a, an intense tearing pain. And I don't know how, know how they know to describe it as that, but they will. Or someone will say, it just feels like somebody ripped my guts out. And that is a, that's a sign of, of abruptio placenta, the only thing that's going to save a full-term baby and mom probably at that point would be, especially baby, would be an immediate C-section. So it may be too late by the time we get them to the hospital. All we can do is rapid transport and pray that and support, provide supportive care for mom and pray that it, that it's enough. Placenta previa generally has no pain. Remember I told you that's when the placenta develops and covers the uterus. And as labor begins, baby's head is forced through the placenta and causes bleeding. That's more of a, a painless onset of bleeding, but it is it is tremendous amount of bleeding. Okay, that's normal. And what they're showing here, normal, normal placenta placement, I forgot the proper term for that and it doesn't matter, but that's normal location of the placenta, but it's been torn away from the fundus of the uterus up here and that's going to cause tremendous bleeding. Uh, uterine rupture is also in trauma, there's a risk of that. Down here we have the placenta in the wrong place and Babies pushing against that and and that tear is causing bleeding. Also, when you have placenta placed down here during contractions, baby's head can compress the the cord and that can cause a hypoxic injury to the baby. Okay, this chart is from my advanced students. A big thing to remember here. 
Placenta previa, this is from a medical school textbook, and I use this with my advanced students. But with placenta previa, generally that's a painless onset of bleeding. Abruptio placenta, where we have that tearing the placenta away from the wall of the uterus, that's painful. Uh, quite often bright, bright red blood with placenta previa, more dark colored with with abruptio placenta, uh, that's everything you need to worry about there. Okay, past, uh, passage of the fetus prior to 20 weeks gestation uh, is a spontaneous abortion. Uh, well, it can be a spontaneous abortion. If it occurs naturally, then there's induced or therapeutic abortion that would be the medical necessity save the life of the mother type thing. Uh, and then there's a third, and the third is an elective abortion. So spontaneous is the miscarriage, which is what, what term you were probably most familiar with before this class, would be miscarriage or spontaneous abortion, and then therapeutic abortion, is a type of induced abortion, which is the save the life of the mom thing. And then the other induced would be the elective abortion. So, okay. Spontaneous abortion, we may be called and we may, we may be dealing with that in EMS. Uh, Sometimes it's, they're just in the process of the spontaneous abortion. Sometimes they have already uh, dis discharged the little fetus. And, I can, and whether it's spontaneous or induced, bleeding is a serious complication, and then there's a, a risk of infection. Uh, infection we're probably not going to see. Unless the miscarriage happened earlier, and mom didn't go to the, she didn't go see anybody. She didn't go to the doctor. She didn't go to the ER. She didn't call us. And then there's a high risk of infection. And we might see a, a young woman in septic shock. And that, that might be the cause. Whether it's hemorrhagic shock or septic shock, how could we tell the difference? One big way to keep filed away in your brain, quick review, that would be the whether or not mom has a temperature, right? If we're dealing with infection and sepsis, then mom's going to be febrile. She's going to have a fever, and she's going to have more of a red-colored skin for a while, and then it becomes pale. But And then with hypovolemic shock or hemorrhagic shock, you're going to have pale, diaphoretic, tachycardic during compensatory shock and then in compensated shock. And then as mom decompensates, her blood pressure will fall, right? That hadn't changed. That doesn't change just because mom's pregnant. Whew, man, we got to keep going. Uh, in, increased chance of uh, domestic violence during pregnancy. It's not always a happy event. It can be a stressful time in. Uh, in a home, maybe there are, maybe there's already way too many mouths to feed, and that makes somebody turn into an idiot and do something that should never happen, which is is to abuse a woman, especially a pregnant woman. I say especially, and that just takes it to a whole new level because it should never happen anyway, and. Uh, and then, uh, I don't know, there are some men, they think they're not getting enough attention anymore, uh, sexual attention or otherwise, and uh, maybe they deal with that by consuming alcohol or, or drug abuse, and then they come home and, and slap their wife, girlfriend, significant other, uh, whatever, whatever it is, slap them around. And they'll tend to just always want to punch them in the gut. That's just so they 
you know, punch the baby in the face, I guess. That increases the chance of spontaneous abortion, premature delivery, low birth weight. If, and then that increases the risk of uh, peripartum or before birth, peripartum bleeding, uh, infection, and even uterine rupture. They also like to kick them in the, in the abdomen. Good Lord. I, there have been some calls that I've run that I really wanted to hurt somebody. And this is, and these, the few of these, I didn't run a lot of these. A few of these I ran, it was hard not to hurt somebody. We need to look for any signs of abuse. Uh, and remember those, those don't change. So uh, bruises in various stages of healing, black eyes, uh, scrapes to the face, bruises on the abdomen, bruises on the legs, uh, those kinds of things. And we, like always, we don't question, ask questions about that in front of the potential abuser. And boy, those, these guys, they hover like a freaking helicopter because they don't want anybody to know. And they, and they've already told them there will be hell to pay if you thought this was bad, there'll be hell to pay if you ever tell anybody about this. So we have to separate them. And the way I always did that, and the way I recommend you do that, number one, we need to call law enforcement. But, but the way that I recommend doing this is, I'm sorry, company policy doesn't allow anybody to ride in the ambulance. You're going to have to bring your car and follow. And then I have, I have, uh, pregnant mom in my controlled environment with my doors locked and he is nowhere around. And I guess these days you could have two women together and one of them pregnant. And then it's, so I say, I'm saying he, cause I'm old, but so it could be, these days could be two women. All right. So, uh, so separate them that way. That's always the best way. A young pregnant girl, a potentially pregnant girl, who you need to ask questions of regarding sexual activity, uh, possibly being pregnant, or abuse, and or, and then let's move on to to drugs and alcohol. Separate them from the, from the parents by getting the parents to follow you, and then you have them in your controlled environment. Tell them it's company policy. That might be a lie. I don't care. I'm going to prove a lie in this case. Tell them it's company policy that they can't ride along. And then, and if they're getting huffy about it, then call law enforcement. Okay. Substance abuse in pregnant women uh, can cause premature birth. It can cause low birth weight, can cause severe respiratory distress and even fetal death, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, you have these things. You have a, a very low birth weight baby. The baby is born prematurely with a very undeveloped, underdeveloped uh, respiratory anatomy uh, and then uh, profound respiratory distress that we have to deal with with positive pressure ventilation and uh, manage their manage their airway positive pressure ventilation with 100 percent o2 uh, sometimes these babies are just there you have you have in utero death uh, perinatal death and then you have you deliver a dead baby and that's a bad bad thing to been there done that okay um what else do i need to say so Look for any clues. Number one, keep yourself safe. Don't, don't confront mom. Don't accuse mom. We always have to ask the question when we get a history, uh, have you had any alcohol use during your pregnancy? Well, my, my OB doc told me to, that I could have a small glass of wine sometimes if I was having trouble going to sleep. Okay, that's a little different than empty booze bottles all over the place. So that would be a sign. But she may be telling you that the doc said have just a little bit of wine. A little bit of wine 
is one bottle a night for her instead of her usual four that she had in before she was pregnant. Look for any drug paraphernalia that run. It might not be hers, but we need to investigate. We need to make a report of that so that that can be investigated uh, by the doctor, ER doc. And the ER doc may call CPS and get them involved. And uh, that could be a crazy situation. I hadn't been there, done that one, but I guess it's feasible it could happen. Okay, and then any statements by family or bystanders, uh, or maybe things that they say. Remember in our patient care report, anything the patient say it says, we're gonna say patient state stated, and then quotation marks, whatever she said, verbatim. And then uh, patient's mother stated, and then quotation marks exactly, or bystander stated. If you can identify the bystander, that, that's always best for down the road investigation if it came to that. Uh, most newborns don't need resuscitation, okay. Man, I may have to record the, the environmental emergencies and let you just watch it and leave it off the dang. No, I can't do that. Okay. Okay, you already know those things. Uh, okay, so this is important to hit. Because of the increased in total circulating blood volume, and that potential of up to 20% increase in heart rate. Mom may have lost considerable amount of blood before you ever see any signs of shock. That also means that that mom may not may not compensate for as long because what can't mom do with what the what's the beta one effect of of adrenaline on the heart, increase in heart rate. Well, crap, we already did that, right? We already got a 20% increase. So we can only bump that a little bit to increase cardiac output. And because of that, mom can't compensate as well, so she's gonna crash faster. The thing that is, is the compensatory mechanism here before you start to see signs is all that up to 50% increase in total circulating blood volume. So that's, that's kind of how that works out uh, pathophysiology wise. And then the uh, uterus is vulnerable to penetrating trauma and blunt trauma. And then sometimes the uterus spontaneously ruptures. I, I lost a little brother that way. I, he, and he was, my mom was supposed to have a C-section the next day. And then that night she became extremely hypertensive, went into labor. The doctor wouldn't come to the hospital the way things used to be. There wasn't an ER doc in 1969 or 67, 68, I mean. And the doc wouldn't come to the hospital. He said, oh, she's scheduled for C-section at 6.30 tomorrow morning, I'll see you then. Her uterus ruptured, another doctor happened to be in the hospital and took care of my mom or I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have my mom. That's, so that spontaneous does happen. But uh, So any penetrating trauma to the lower abdomen in a pregnant woman, we need to be concerned that there might be penetrating trauma to the uterus. Again, it's very has an extremely rich blood supply and it bleeds quickly. So, and then any blunt injuries. Blunt injuries that could also be improperly placed seat belt because proper seat belt placement is to move that lap belt portion of the seat belt down under that, that pregnant abdomen and get it down on the across the pel across the the hips and lower pelvis so it'll hold so it so it doesn't put pressure on the uterus and the shoulder belt isn't going to hurt anything it going across but if that is improperly placed that can cause in a in a 
rapid deceleration that can cause blunt injuries. Okay. Um, trauma is the leading cause of ruptio placenta. Remember that's that that tearing pain where that's that placenta is ripped away from the from the uterus and and it have can have massive vaginal bleeding and severe abdominal pain, uh, rapid transport, uh, non-rebreather mask in left lateral recumbent position and call for ALS. Uh, we're not gonna stay and wait for them. And if it's gonna take too long for them to meet us, we're gonna get to the, the closest hospital with sur surgical capabilities. Depending on what your protocol is, contact online medical control. They will advise you, get that patient to the hospital so they can they can do an emergency C-section and maybe get in there and stop that bleeding. There's ALS-wise, the only thing that really that they could add that you're not gonna be able to do, they can start an IV, that doesn't save anything, but they can push a drug called TXA, uh, and TXA can help with help with maintaining coagulation. Uh, but anyway, it's it's a catastrophic thing. Fortunately, you don't see it that much. I say that, and you'll see two in a shift, but just you just don't see it that much. Uh, cardiac arrest. What do we do? Uh, we need to do CPR, right, and provide transport. That's our job. That's what we're here for. Uh, compressions might have to be a little higher up the sternum. And other than that, we just do CPR. So obviously it's adult CPR, right? Okay. Uh, treating pregnant patient. Maintain open airway, high flow oxygen, ensure adequate ventilation, assess circulation, transport on the left side. Cultural sensitivity we've talked about in other things and cultures that don't allow males to to treat females or even males to be pregnant or pregnant they don't allow that either they don't allow males to be present during childbirth so uh may have to call for a, another ambulance if, if she's bleeding out what do you do you may have to call law enforcement and, and law enforcement take them into protective custody or deal with crowd control so you can beat feet uh, as time goes on and we have more and more immigration and we have more refugees from various countries who move here and we have a high refugee population in Amarillo uh, and we have a considerable number of Middle Easterners uh, and that and a higher number of a very traditional Islamic uh, people, and they do not allow men to be present during, I guess they allow them to be there for conception. They don't allow them to be there for anything else. Okay, we talked about teenagers already. Occasionally childbirth is kind of unexpected. I delivered one, the woman swore that she, she never knew she was pregnant. She just thought she had, she had a GI virus, and I don't know. And she was she was a large woman, and she said that that gain and loss of thirty or forty pounds was not a, not abnormal in her life. And because of her weight, she had very sporadic menstrual periods. So I don't know. I mean, I I can't call her a liar. I'm not inside her body, so. Okay, uh, BSI, body, body substance isolation. Gloves on, scene safe, right? We have uh, gown, gloves, uh, eye protection, and right now, masks. So you you got the full garb on right now. Okay, uh, mechanism of injury, uh, where that's appropriate, take note. Uh, nature of illness and pregnant women can still have gallbladder issues. They can have uh, it's not at all uncommon to for a pregnant woman to have pancreatitis. 
uh, it's uh, uh, renal disease. Uh, you can have some exacerbations of renal disease, uh, seizure disorder. All seizures in pregnant women aren't due to don't result from preeclampsia and they're not due to eclampsia. It could be that mom has, what you call that stuff, epilepsy. Whew. Okay, still get a general impression. Uh, we try to determine whether mom is in active labor, whether we're hit, where we're into that second stage of labor, where we need to deliver a baby. We don't need to go anywhere. Uh, we need, still need to assess for life threats. We need to manage airway. As always, we need to manage circulation, uh, make our transport decision. If delivery isn't imminent, we have time to transport. What did I tell you? At least what you can operate off of in the field, whether, whether or not there's crowning is really, that's your, oh, what do they have in the, in, in the, uh, for space launches that they have their they have their go no go de decisions that they go no go decision tree so uh, and they go around to all these different people who are monitoring all these different things of the launch and they do their go no go check and and they'll say Capcom's go, uh, life supports go, or out on down, whatever they are, down this decision tree, and ours crowning is our go no go. So it's a no go if you see a little head there, bulging perineum, all of that stuff. Okay, rapid transport if there's significant pain, uh, bleeding, hypertensive, hypotensive, actively having a seizure altered mental status, uh, OB history. We're gonna start with the date of the last known menstrual period. Maybe it's an approximate, about when was it? Was it, was it Christmas day? Was it close to Christmas? Was it about New Year's, uh, close to Valentine's day? Was it around spring break? Was it Easter? Uh, was it Memorial day, the fourth? Uh, that is that is the calendar for some people, so they those kind of days they know. What was it close to your birthday? When's your birthday? Oh, well, how close to your birthday was it? Like a week or two? Or I mean, that's that is the world we work in, folks. And then you could throw into that a language barrier, so you can't ask any of that. Holy smokes! Okay, so we're going to come up, if they don't know an expected due date, we're going to use last known menstrual period plus 36 weeks. That'll give us trimesters, kind of know what we're dealing with, all right? Any complications along the way, uh, diagnose, or maybe without prenatal care, more of a self-diagnose. What kind of, have you had any problems? What were those problems? What were they like? When did they happen? How long did they go on? That's a, who, what, where, when, why, how? That's the, that's how we ask questions in the courtroom, and that's how we ask questions of our patients who are not good historians. And then we still don't get the information sometimes. Or it all changes once we get to the hospital. All of a sudden at the hospital, they had prenatal care and they know everything. Uh, and they know, their, they know their last known menstrual period, they know their due date. They know it all, but when we have them, they don't know a flipping thing. It just that is our world, and it always just kind of irritated the crap out of me. But that's all right. That's why we call it EMS, I guess. Okay, get and get a good medical history, not just an OB history. That would be tunnel vision, and we don't do tunnel vision in this business. So medical history, uh, diabetes, cardiac issues, uh, respiratory issues, all of the normal things that we get in a sample history, we still have to get plus an OB history. Then we're going to add some things to our sample history. Uh, are there are there contractions? Okay, let's see. Uh, due date. Uh, if they're having contractions, how often are they? How often is she having contractions from the end of one to the beginning of the next one? How far 
apart are they spaced? The closer together they get, the closer you are to delivery. The, the longer they last from the beginning to the time it ends, the closer you're getting to, to imminent delivery. So those two working together, they may not be timing their contractions. Our patients probably aren't. We have to try to do that, have our partner do that while we're doing other stuff. But so that's, uh, and the patient may just, is, are they lasting a long time? Do they feel like they last forever? Are they getting closer together? How close to, excuse me, how close together? Oh, 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 have a watch. Okay. Uh, so when a commercial starts on TV, if you, do, if the contraction started then, would they be over before the com all the commercials were over and the next TV show started? Right? Or the TV show started back? I don't know. You have to be creative, I guarantee you. Another biggie, has the water broken or has the water not broken? If the water has broken and baby hasn't delivered yet, then what color was the fluid? Maybe they've moved. Maybe they started to the hospital in the car and that, and they didn't make it all the way and they called us and we're not going to be on scene to see this this greenish meconium stained amniotic fluid meconium is baby's first bowel movement when baby gets in distress uh, enough distress they will have that bowel movement in utero and two things i'll tell you about that bowel movement Number one, it stains, that's the placenta right there. It's, it's stained green and baby has that, uh, dang it, I just forgot what you call that, that cottage cheese just kind of covering over the, coating over the baby in utero. We'll get to it in a minute, I just spaced out, but it's stained kind of green. It'll, baby will clean up. That's not the big deal. The big deal is baby had to be in severe distress for that to happen. So that is something we need to report to the hospital early. And when baby's head starts to deliver and you're seeing greenish amniotic fluid around mom's perine perineum and, and around her, her vaginal area, you need, as soon as that head delivers, and the head turns so that you can get a bulb syringe in there. We have to suction baby thoroughly uh, before baby ever takes a breath because the that fecal matter, if baby aspirates that, meconium aspiration is a is a horrible complication. It results in two different things it can it results can result in meconium aspiration pneumonia it can also that fecal matter can act like a little ball valve way down deep in the in the alveoli and when baby takes a takes a breath it forces the fecal matter down and it blocks that passage of of that oxygenated air coming down and it's a it's a killer. It can be. Okay. Enough of that one. We've got to keep moving. Uh, do a complete head to toe physical examination of mom. Uh, ask if there are any other complaints aside from I'm in labor. Uh, we need to be keep an eye on timing those contractions. Again, the closer they are together, the closer you're getting to delivery. And the longer and the more intense those contractions are, and it's like a wave. It's like a wave of pain. They tell me, I've never had it, but it's like a wave of pain that kind of wraps around the abdomen and pushes down toward the, the pelvic, the, toward the, pel the pubic symphysis. And, that's, and sometimes it starts in the back and then moves down toward the pubic symphysis. So that would be uh, signs of, of true labor. Uh, get vital signs, take a special note for 
uh, very tachycardic or hypohypertensive. Uh, we talked about the 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 importance of noting that hypertension regarding preeclampsia and eclampsia. Uh, reassessment. We're going to be reassessing how. Uh, tell me when your when your next contraction begins. Okay, boom. I need to write a time down. I'm going to put strips of three inch tape on the legs of my pants as much as I can get on there. Start at the top left and then I'm going to keep a flow sheet and uh, contraction and then put a time beside it and then have her tell you when that contraction ends and then you're going to put in with the time and then and then she's going to tell you when the next contraction begins. So, and and you get a you have a flow sheet on that tape that way. Don't write it on your gloves. You're going to end up changing gloves. Those dry erase marker walls and ambulances, those are great till somebody brushes against them and you lose your whole flow sheet. So, I say you can't go wrong with either starting your phone recording so you can talk and you can note all that stuff, but then what if technology screws up? So you can end up with a complete flow sheet like they keep in a hospital, but on tape on your legs, and then you could have the time of birth, you can have your one minute APGAR, you can have your five minute APGAR, you can have everything right there on your legs. So, and if you run out of space, you peel off tape and stick it somewhere that you can peel it off and haul it in with you. Stick it on the back of a piece of paper. That's just, or on the front, I don't care. But you need to keep, and you need to keep that kind of flow with every call, but especially with, with, with OB. Okay. So there are legal times that we need to report, or legal time, that time of birth. And there's uh, the one in, one in five minute app cars that, that uh, the ER doc's going to want. Uh, maybe if if they had an OB doc and we just didn't make it to the hospital, then the OB doc's going to want those, and then the pediatrician is really going to want them. Okay, give radio report. As soon as you see that delivery is imminent, contact online medical control, let them know, and keep them posted on the delivery, not to the point that it interferes with patient care, and delivery of baby. Okay. Remember you have two patient care reports to complete. Okay, we've done the stages of labor. Okay, this gravita thing, since I don't have a board. Prima gravita or prima, prima gravita. That is first pregnancy. And then multi gravita is being pregnant more than one time. Prima gravita labor generally takes longer uh, just things aren't stretched out quite as much the cervix is the cervix is tighter and in a prima gravita it dilates more slowly uh, false labor especially with the first pregnancy uh, those may freak mom out more because she may think it's time uh, okay Premature amniotic sac rupture, you get an amniotic fluid leak in that uh, early in the pregnancy, too early in the pregnancy. They can actually go in and suture, uh, dilate, the, dilate the, the cervix and go in and so uh, do, place sutures and so that amniotic sac so that it, so that the leak stops and then they may have to set uh, suture the cervix also and then when time comes for delivery they can either do a c-section or go in there and dilate things manually and and open it i don't know i'm not a there is a table in your book that does a good job of distinguishing braxton hicks contractions remember that's going to the gym so the so the uterus gets ready to play the ball game at the end versus true labor. Uh, that's a good thing to look at. I'm not going to read it to you. Okay. 
Second stage, uh, that's when the full cervical dilation and the baby's engaged in the birth can canal ends with birth. Uh, I don't have a picture. Dang it. It just sucks not having the that video work. But anyway, you see bulging in the perineum and and the that's called crowning. Third stage, baby's born and then delivery of the of the placenta. Sometimes that takes a lot more than 30 minutes. That placenta has to completely separate and then contractions have to deliver that thing and it can take a lot longer than that. Your book indicates you should stay on the scene to deliver a placenta. Uh, you could probably go ahead and transport. If there's a lot of bleeding, then we need a second ambulance, somebody to transport baby, somebody to transport mama. If mom's in, in, in severe distress, or if baby's in severe distress, call for a second ambulance so you can separate them and you have to, because you have two patients to focus on. Okay. Questions to ask uh, to determine if delivery is imminent. How long have you been pregnant? What's your due date? What's the date of your last known menstrual period? Is this your first baby? Very important question, right? Uh, are you having contractions? How long do they last? How, how long is it from the time one ends until the next one begins? Have you had any spotting or bleeding? Uh, has your water broken? Remember, we're also going to ask, uh, what did the fluid look like? Was it clear or maybe a little bit on the yellowish side? Or did it have a a really distinct color to it should be clear it shouldn't be yellow either but sometimes they'll tell you that I don't know why because I think it kind of on a white sheet it kind of gets a little bit of a yellow uh, appearance also very slick on an ambulance floor by the way uh, be prepared and do you feel the need to have a bowel movement that is that's a biggie. They're getting closer, very close to delivery if they feel like they got to go poop. It, uh, and they'll tell you about that, but you still need to ask about it. Uh, do you feel like you need to have a bowel movement? No. Yes. I've encountered patients who didn't know what I meant by a bowel movement. I um, mean, I have been to the point of saying, do you feel like you need to go take a dump? That's, and that's just a pressure thing, really. That's what they're feeling. Do you feel the need to push? then don't, unless we want to deliver a baby. Okay. Complications. Do you have any problems with, if you, uh, with any previous pregnancies, if, so you have para and gravida, para and gravida. Para is the number of living kids that the parents have. Gravida is the number of pregnancies. So, and then there's abortio. So be careful with that one because have you, have you had any miscarriages or lost any babies? So para, how many kids do you have now? Gravida, how many times you've been pregnant? And then abortio is the number of lost pregnancies or the number of abortions of any kind, number of miscarriages, uh, pregnancies that didn't make it. So that's, those are the, Three things that you'll hear them talk about, and those are three things that you need to try to establish if you can. Any previous deliveries were their C-sections. Uh, there may be a problem with the vaginal delivery if there are previous C-sections, depending on which way they made the cut in the uterus. If it's up and down, there's a high risk of uterine rupture with contractions. If it's a, if it's a horizontal incision in the uterus, then they can still have a normal vaginal delivery in the future. And some would say, oh, well, all you have to do is look at the scar on mom's abdomen. It is possible to make horizontal incision through the skin, through the muscle, and get down to the uterus and still make a vertical 
straight up and down midline incision in the uterus. So be careful there. Uh, if mom has had previous C-sections, do everything you can to avoid delivering that baby yourself because of the risk of uterine rupture, complications or problems with previous pregnancies, or this one, uh, do you drink any alcohol? Uh, do you take any prescription medications? Do you take any medications not prescribed for you? Uh, do you use any street drugs? Uh, some will be honest, some won't. Uh, any chance you're having twins or more than that? Uh, God, I hope not, she usually answer. Okay, uh, does your doctor expect any complications with, with this delivery? If, if she says she needs to move her bowels or feels like she needs to push, that baby's engaged in the birth canal, we need to stay in play. That means we need to deliver a baby there, especially for seeing crowning. Contact online medical control. Uh, con medical control may tell you uh, if she just says she needs to have a bowel movement, but doesn't really feel like she needs to push, let's go ahead and transport. Then if crowning starts or she feels like she needs to have a bowel movement, pull that rig over, get your partner back there. There's an extra set of hands, contact online medical control, tell them what you're doing, and then you stay there and deliver a baby. Maintain a mom's privacy. Don't open the doors of the back doors of the ambulance so the family can have have a drive-in viewing because uh, because they were all going to be in the birthing room anyway, right? That's don't don't do that. Okay, it's okay to get dad or patient's mom or I mean, as long as there's room. I, I wouldn't have a problem if, if they're chill and they had not a abuser to let them be in there and. You want to be there when your kid's born, right? So be sensitive to those things too. Don't kick, don't kick dad out of the room. Don't, don't kick a hand holder out of the room. Just don't let him get in your way. Don't, don't, the patient hold their legs together. Don't let them get up and go to the bathroom. They'll, they'll drop a baby in a toilet. I, I've never seen it, but I've had partners and co-workers who have told me about that and fishing a baby out of a toilet. It's a bad, it's just a crappy way to start life, right? Okay. Um, OB kit, that's what's in it. Uh, preserve patient's privacy. Make sure you're on a firm surface that's padded with blankets, sheets, and towels. You're, if you have it, you're going to put down a sterile sheet. Uh, you're going to be using sterile gloves after you open the OB kit with your exam gloves on. Shuck those things, cram your sweaty hands into the sterile gloves, following the appropriate way to don sterile gloves. Watch a video of that online, by the way, or on YouTube. Learn how to put on sterile gloves and keep them sterile and how to take them off without contaminating yourself. That's important. Uh, I could show you, but go watch it on, go watch it on YouTube. Make a note to yourself to do that. And as baby starts to deliver, we're going to hold some back pressure on the head. You can either do that like this or with the palm of your hand. But either way, uh, support the head, neck, and upper back. Uh, keep mom with her knees, with her knees and hips flexed, with her feet flat on. The bed, the floor, your cot, and then you're down there in the in the baseball catcher position, uh, holding back pressure on that head. Why do we do that? To prevent explosive delivery. Explosive delivery doesn't hurt baby, but it causes tearing from the vagina down into the perineum, and in extreme instances, it will tear all the way down to the rectum. And that's, that's, that's extremely rare, but those are just nasty little tears to suture up. There's always going to be some tearing, even when they cut an episiotomy. We don't cut episiotomies in EMS unless somebody's medical director teaches them how and assumes liability for that. And I've had residents try to get me to cut an episiotomy when I was 
doing clinicals in paramedic school, and I was smart enough to say no, even though I kind of wanted to, because so I could say I did, because I was 20 years old, and you want to do stuff, right? I wanted to, I wanted to cut an episiotomy, but I knew not to. I didn't want to get kicked out of paramedic school for doing a surgical procedure. Only surgical procedure we do is, for the most part, airways and chest tubes. All right. Uh, open your OB kit, sterile sheets. There's drapes to put on mom's knees. It is normal while mom's pushing for her to have little bowel movements, sometimes a big bowel movement. Throw something over that to keep that separated from baby and then move that fecal material out of the way and then put another sheet there. I don't know why we maintain a sterile field. Babies were born for thousands of years without it, but we do try to. Uh, your partner, if there's no, it's going to be if your partner isn't helping you, your partner's going to be helping keep times and stuff for you. But uh, comfort, soothe, and reassure the mom. Get out the essential oils and and play some light Eastern music in the background. Uh, just help mom. Uh, hold mom's hand. Let mom squeeze your hand till you feel like yours is going to break off. Head should be the presenting part. It shouldn't be the, okay, we can't show that either. Uh, unruptured amniotic sac. We have to get it out of the way. Expect amniotic fluid, which fluid, which is sit, really slick after it comes up. I can attest to these things. Uh, if you lose pul the pulse in the cord and that amniotic sac isn't out of the way, it's going to suffocate that baby and you're going to have a dead baby. And I've had dead on the scene baby before from that exact thing where teenage girl delivered baby by herself baby was in the amniotic sac and she just left it there scared kid she was like 14 it's like her third baby at 14. you're gonna have to puncture the sac it's not super tough i i was able to tear it with my fingers it's tough but it's not it's tough when it's inside a uterus. Okay, uh, and then when the head delivers, get the get the mouth and nose suctioned out immediately. That's where the rupture of the sac or the baby's head spontaneous delivers spontaneously delivers after the sac rupturing on its own. Call that membranes rupturing. It's, we need to note what time mom's water broke too, because you have 24 hours for delivery after that. If the baby hadn't delivered in 24 hours, they're going to have to do a C-section. They may do it sooner if it hasn't happened. Uh, nuchal cord, cord wrapped around a baby's neck. Very, very common, very scary for everybody. Something that you need to note in your PCR. Slip that cord over baby's head. I've seen them, seen them wrapped like four and five times, and that can get hard to unwrap. Unwrap it if you can at all. I feel if there's a pulse in it, that's a good sign. If it's wrapped and there's a pulse in it, then do everything you can to keep from cutting it and removing it because now we've lost uh, mother to baby uh, fetal circulation. So not fetal circulation, uh, fetal perfusion via the umbilical cord. So if you cut that, you got to get, you got to make sure that baby has a, a patent airway, unobstructed open patent airway, and then get, and then get baby delivered. Um, that's what it looks like. Uh, get fingers under there without crimping that cord so that you lose a pulse and slip that over. Better to slip it over one at a time. This happens when there's a longer than normal cord and kids do gymnastics inside there and then get that sucker wrapped up when they're twirling around. Scared the snot, there's another one. Gotta get that loose. Uh, that, and normally you don't see that and babies, Head 
delivers, we're going to get use bulb syringe and suction the mouth out, mouth out really good, then suction the nose out. Every time you suction, squirt it there on the on a towel or whatever you have or a sheet and and get it suctioned out really good. Once the head delivers, the baby's going to deliver quickly unless they have shoulder dystocia. In that case, the shoulder gets stuck on the pubic bone. You can get that baby delivered real easily by you just grab up by the baby's shoulder, not by the neck. Just get your thumb, get your thumbs there and push down to help get baby's shoulder under mom's pubic bone and then that baby will go ahead and deliver. If not, you can just kind of pull up slightly and the baby's going to deliver. You don't see that very often, but I don't want you to have a baby that's stuck when you're trying to deliver one and you just don't know what to do. So that's all you do. It's easy. Just down, get that shoulder under the pubic bone and then baby's going to deliver easily. They're slippery little sucker, suckers. They're covered with vernix, uh, cassiosa, sassiosa. It's like cesarean, so it's sassiosa, I believe. And but we just call it vernix. It's like it's kind of like cottage cheese, real thin cottage cheese film all over the baby, and and it bathes off. We don't really have to worry about it. We're going to dry baby off, get the amniotic fluid off, and get down to that vernix, and then. We're going to wrap baby up, swaddle them. We're going to, first we need to assess the baby. So we need to, we need to check them out. And then after we've done this, an assessment of that neonate, we can wrap them and give them to mom. But, uh, or we can dry them off and then just, if mom wants, lay the baby on her chest and encourage mom to go ahead and start nursing that baby. Uh, that, that stimulation of the nipple with the baby's mouth suckling, that causes the release of oxytocin, which is a hormone that is, which is a hormone that that causes smooth muscle contraction, and that will help squeeze. You have to make sure there's not another baby in there. So we need to make sure we're not dealing with multiples. But well, that still helped then. Never mind. But uh, encourage mom to let the baby suckle and that will help squeeze the uterus down. That will help move the plus, move the placenta out. And then that will help with vaginal bleeding, postpartum, uh, uterine bleeding. So that's, uh, that works. That works. That's a, that's God's way right there. So don't forget that. Clamp and cut the cord if your protocol allows. Some don't. Some only allow you to clamp it. Uh, I guess somebody got carried away with the scissors and cut a baby, cut a baby in half. I don't know. Uh, one, one guy screws up and ruins it for all of us, right? Had to be a guy. It wasn't a girl who did that. Okay, get your one-minute app car. Uh, and then, I mean, it can take a long time for that placenta to deliver. There we go. Looky there. Uh, here's my two minutes. Uh, dang, I got to get on through this. Uh, baby gets about uh, over 30% more blood volume, circulating blood volume. If you give a couple of minutes for before clamping and cutting the cord, iron reserve is in baby, which is uh, very important. Uh, mineral uh, that increases that almost double and uh, so that decreases the risk of anemia in the baby decreases the need for neonatal blood transfusions uh, reduces risk of intraventricular hemorrhage we're not talking the heart ventricles we're talking ventricles of the brain and it keeps supplying the baby with oxygen. So we get the baby good and oxygenated. So that is, uh, that's not from your book. So that's something that, that's something to have a conversation with, with medical control about and with your medical director about maybe. If they tell you, you can't do that, you can't do that. Clamp it and cut it when they tell you. They're the doctor, you aren't, but now you see the advantages. So, if you're going to have a baby, meaning 
you and your significant other guys or uh, or or girls uh, these days and or uh, young ladies who are pregnant talk to your doctor about delayed cord cutting that's uh, and this this video will still be out there that so you can access it on my YouTube channel and if you're going to have a baby and you want to go back and watch this and you remember this little slide it, they say it can be really beneficial uh, okay this is fundal massage what is being done here using a gloved hand so you have the gown on you have drapes you have and and massage fundal the fundus of the uterus which is that top part in a firm circular circular motion and that will help stop bleeding it causes contraction okay we already talked about all of these things uh record time of birth emergency situations uh more than 30 minutes elapsed before the and the placenta hasn't delivered contact medical control sometimes that's not a great big thing usually we're not gonna once babies all assessed and and we've done all our initial stuff and we have our two patients under control then we're we're off and going to the hospital we're not waiting to deliver the placenta even though your book says stay and deliver the placenta, which would be the answer on the National Registry, unless there's, there's patient starts having massive vaginal bleeding, uh, gets in distress, those kinds of things. National Registry would say stay there and deliver the placenta. Okay. Uh, neonatal resuscitation. Let's take a five minute break. We've been going forever. All right. Five minutes and we'll resuscitate a neonate. And I will probably end up letting you watch the recording of my environmental emergencies lecture from last semester. This stuff right here is more important to your practice in EMS and to your national registry than me going slide by slide through environmental emergencies. So we're probably just going to stop with one chapter today because it's a long one. It's a hard one, but I mean, not hard as in difficult, just hard to go through all these dang slides, 140 of them. Uh, but uh, you can watch that environmental emergencies video from last semester and you'll be fine and it's there on my YouTube channel. Sorry, I'm not going faster, but this needs to be covered thoroughly as well. Let's take five minutes and be back and finish her off. Neonatal assessment and resuscitation. We now have two patients. Excuse me, we're still following standard precautions. Always put gloves on before handling a newborn. You're already going to be gloved up when you deliver the baby. When you're down to assessing, you can go ahead and change gloves. Uh, I, would, I would don sterile gloves again. We don't use sterile gloves that much in EMS. This is a time to use them. Normally, they're going to be breathing spontaneously, uh, usually well before 15 seconds, but definitely well before 30 seconds. If that baby's not breathing by 15 to 30 seconds, we need to stimulate the baby, tap them on the bottom of the foot. I, the best way, we're going to be doing this anyway. We're already going to be drying them off with a towel. So we've delivered baby. We put baby on a towel or a sheet, a towel's best because it's a little bit rougher, and we're drying baby off and r just rub the baby's back. So that's baby's back, and we're just rubbing baby's back with that towel and stimulating them. If they start, don't start breathing after about 30 seconds, then we need to go ahead and make sure they're suctioned really good, suction them again, and go ahead and, and start uh, ventilations with a BVM, one breath every three seconds, every three to five, every three would be best. Uh, heart rate should be 120 or higher. Remember, if it's below 60, 60 we're doing chest compressions. Uh, that would, would stimulate them, and it still doesn't come up to above 60, we're doing chest compressions. With a neonate, with an infant, I remember infant CPR, 
uh, two person is is hands encircling and using a, both thumbs. Uh, if you forgot and you just did the two fingers on the chest, it's not the end of the world. It's just easiest. It's you get more. They say you get better blood flow with the with the hands encircling method. So uh, that's the. It's not the end of the world if you forgot. It's, uh, if they if they if they're not responsive right off the bat, uh, flick the soles of their heat, feet, rub their back. Um, babies have trouble. Uh, new newborns, neonates have trouble maintaining their body temperature more than even more than other babies. So we need to make sure we get them dried and wrapped up good so and their head covered so that we can help maintain that body heat their their highest percentage of body surface area is their head so their heads so we need to make sure that we cover their head to to prevent that heat loss initially uh, position their airway get them dry keep them warm suction them with the bulb, bulb syringe there was a for for years national registry wanted to know whether you suction the mouth or the nose first the answer was the mouth and the way i always remembered that and taught that was after if you were getting suction with the bulb syringe would you would you want the snot stuck in your mouth or would you want a clean bulb syringe in your mouth and then suction the nose okay uh, take a look at that chart. Position baby on their back with their head slightly down, neck extended, suction the mouth and the nose. There it is. Uh, observe for spontaneous respirations, skin color, movement of the extre extremities, overall activity. Rather than taking a heart rate at the base, of the, I want you to, I want you to palpate a pulse on the umbilical cord because I want you to, to allow that circulation for as long as protocol allows it up to that two minutes that we looked at. Uh, just throw your, throw your stethoscope on, flip it around to the bell side, and that's the one that doesn't have the diaphragm. Or if you have two diaphragms, use the little diaphragm and get an apical pulse on the newborn it's it is it's hard enough to count it without trying to palpate it so throw your ears on uh, use the bell side or the really small uh, diaphragm side and and do an, get an apical pulse right there by the left nipple and it's fast i mean we're talking 100 and 120 140 so that's that's two or more a second and it is hard to count and but but you need to do it and so that is where you get a pulse uh the this is great take a look at this chart in your book the this is your treatment for that neonate based on their heart rate so it's 100 beats more than 100 beats a minute that's normal range. We just need to treat them like a baby and tr newborn baby and transport them, keep them warm, let mom hold them if they, if mom wants to and transport them to the hospital, reassess them every, uh, don't wait the full 15. I don't think if you can reassess them about every five to 10 minutes, even if they're not critical, 60 to a hundred, we're going to ventilate them with the BVM, with room air, why not 100% O2 after the baby's delivered? High oxygen levels in high oxygen delivery in a baby, in a newborn, can cause uh, retinal problems and it can cause it can cause decreased vision and blindness. That's why we're bagging them with room air if they're 60 to 100. Bag them with room air and reassessed after 90 seconds and see if the heart rate has come up and see if spontaneous respirations have started. Uh, if not, then you can go to 100% O2 
uh, call for ALS, continue to reassess, keep them warm. Fewer than 60, uh, we're going to bag them 100% O2 and, and reassess after 90 seconds. And if heart rate doesn't come up after 90 seconds of being bagged with 100% O2, then we're going to start chest compressions, call ALS. Okay. Hand encircling, remember that. Put an X through that. That's the old ratio. Before, the, before you take your national registry, spend plenty of time reviewing American Heart Association CPR that we started with in this course. There will be questions there. And that, believe it or not, that is a big area of failure by new EMT graduates. They forget to go back and review that and it can cause them to fail a registry. So make sure you go back and review all that CPR that we started with. Okay. Uh, if you see amniotic fluid, baby isn't breathing, get them suctioned out fast. Uh, and clear that airway before providing rescue ventilations for the reasons that I already had discussed. Uh, APGAR scoring. I've talked about it the whole morning. Building up to this, right? It wasn't really that intentional. Okay. We're going we're gonna to assign values in five areas. And we're either going to assign a zero, a one, or a two. And there's, there's a judgment call here, especially for us since we don't do it all the time. Areas, APGAR, appearance, pulse, grimace, or irritability, activity and respiration. So APGAR, that's, that's your acronym. It makes it easy to remember. And, uh, man, I need to find it. Oh, I got to find, okay. We're going to get a one minute and a five minute. If the baby looks looks almost dead, that's a zero. If baby looks good, they, their color's good, and they look like they're look like they're being perfused well, then we're, that's give that a two. And if it's halfway between somewhere between, give it a one. Uh, heart rate if it's a hundred or more, that's a two. If it's 60 or below, that's a zero. In between is a one. Grimace, do they get pissed off when you mess with them? That's, do they, are they irritable when you, when you're dry, when you're suctioning them out? Do they start crying and they get all excited and upset when you're drying them off? They get mad and, and you start to listen to that apical pulse and they're screaming and you can't hear it. So then you have to go to the brachial pulse, right? That's, so that's irritability. None at all is a zero. Extremely pissed is a two and anywhere in between is a one in our world. That, there's, there are better ways of assigning this, but I'm giving you something we can work with. Activity, are they flaccid? They don't move at all. They're just like a doll, just totally limp. That's a zero. Are they moving their little extremities around and they look like they want to box you? Look like they want to kickbox you because their arms and their feet are moving and they're crying and they have good strong abdominal muscle tone when they cry and and that's that'd be a two. Somewhere between flaccid and totally pissed off and kickboxing you is a one. Respirations, uh, zero is not, no respiratory effort at all. Uh, 24 a minute would be a two. Don't hold me to that one. I should have looked that up. I apologize. I'll get the answer for you. I think it's 24 a minute would be a two and in between would be a one. That, that gets us the best we can do in our world. And we do that one minute after the time of birth, which we documented. Tell, you, tell, tell, tell your partner, time of birth, and have them, you can write it on your leg, and tell them to watch your watch and tell me when it's been a minute. Okay, boom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to get an APGAR at that one minute. And then in four more minutes, tell me, uh, give me, give me the time so that I can, so I can do another APGAR. 
And it may be the two of you kind of putting your heads together to come up with the APGAR, because it is somewhat subjective, I think, still think, especially on activity and irritability. We don't, and, and appearance is a judgment call too, but heart rate and respirations, we're nailed down on those. And doctors have, they have hard and fast rules for assigning all this stuff, and we ain't going to remember them in our world unless you have a cheat sheet. Um, okay, that's APGAR. Um, here you go. There's a chart. I gave you what works for me. Uh, get. This is another one of those good things to have in your little cheat book. And when you're dispatched to a, a lady in labor, you get your little book out and you flip over to APGAR because that's the thing you're most likely to forget and start looking at APGAR and, and, and then you'll have a cheat sheet in front of you and you will have already, you will have already looked through it. And then you could also have that chart. What am I going to do if things are going south with this baby? That, okay. Those would be two things, good things to have in your little cheat book, whether it is or your personal guidebook, I've heard them called. But uh, those are good things to have there, along with with uh, oh crap, uh, things like your uh, Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, your revised trauma score. Those things that you're going to use, those are really good to have, whether this is digital or it's a little notebook you carry with you. I would, and I would copy those pages out of my book and cut those out and stick them in there. That's the way my book is. It's still in the top drawer of my dresser and it's old. It's, it's, the problem with mine is it's, it's chiseled in stone and it's, it was not very portable, but I was young and strong. Okay. I've already talked about what to do. Request a second unit if the baby's in strength in distress and will require resuscitation. This may mean that you're, if, and, and if mom's all, also not doing well, your partner's taking care of one and you're taking care of the other and that second unit's on the way. But it's not wrong if, you, if, if you're going to have to deliver a baby, it's not wrong to call, to have them go ahead and uh, maybe dispatch fire department to give you some extra hands they'll make the rookie help you and he'll be more scared than you. And, and they come up with funny stories and about all the things the rookie screwed up and he never lives them down and you'd be there to, to witness it. Okay. All right. Breach delivery. Uh, see, that's a, that is a Frank breach. That's a little butt coming out, coming down first. There is a way early enough on for, and, and babies, they grow this way, and at some point they turn and, or some babies grow this way, and at some point they turn and get, get the head down in the right direction, and sometimes they don't turn. Uh, OB docs can actually turn a baby who hasn't turned if they find it early enough, I'd like to watch that sometime, honestly. It's just that pregnant moms don't want strangers in there with them. Unfortunately, we didn't have to do that with either of ours. Breach deliveries take longer if you can transport the baby, tra or mom, transport mom and let them deliver the baby at the hospital. If you see the buttocks past the vagina, you're stuck and you're going to have to deliver that little sucker. Get online medical control on the cell phone, on speaker phone to talk you through it. Mom's going to be even more scared, but you've got to get that baby here. So have your partner reassure her that, that your instructor talked about this in class for way too long. And you just need the doc to, because he needed to be, he or she needed to be able to hear it happen. So I don't know. That's, uh, Buttocks and legs will deliver spontaneously. Support them with your hand. The head is 
almost always face down with to the contour of the of the the sacrum uh, just make a v so that you can keep the walls of the vagina off of off of the baby's mouth and nose so that if the cord is compressed you you could, the baby will can can breathe and be perfused. So once the chest is out, baby's going to want to start breathing. So that's the deal. Okay, you can see that one's trying to walk out. That other one just tried to sit down and just. Okay. Oh, that was. Oh man, how'd I get there? God damn it. Okay, that's a that's a footling breach or a limb presentation. Um, we can't deliver those. I delivered one with, with our medical director talking me through it. Don't, you don't ever want to do that. Uh, there's my big old hand and a, and a vagina involved and in getting a leg in there and then getting the other hand and getting the baby and pulling the baby down. And it's something a paramedic should never do. And, but he was the man. He signed our protocols and he was the ER doc on duty when I was calling to report it and we were going to priority transport and he said, nope, stay there. So, oh man, uh, sometimes you'll get an arm coming out first. You'll have a, a cephalo, baby's head, cephalo pelvic presentation, head coming through the pelvis, but the little sucker tries to stick an arm out and punch a hole through on the way out and and you may have to, with medical control, uh, with medical control clearance, maybe tuck the little arm back in. But uh, your book says rapid transport for that. All right, any limb presentation, rapid transport. Uh, cover the limb with the sterile towel. Uh, don't push. Don't pull. Just go. Prolapse umbilical cord. I've already talked about. We're going to insert two fingers and keep pressure off the cord so that that cord continues pulsing. If that cord stops pulsing, then, and see, we're not going to know if it's like this uh, because we can't see that. We're only going to know prolapse cord if the cord is protruding from the vagina. So that's, in our world, that's where prolapse cord comes in. This kiddo could have already been in major distress as, as the head was engaged with compressing the cord there. All right, don't push the cord back in. Uh, your book says get mom in the left lateral recumbent position and insert two fingers uh, with a gloved hand and keep the baby's head off the umbilical cord so that it continues to pulse and rapid transport. Spina bifida during fetal development, portion of the spinal cord forms outside of the spinal canal where it should normally be and it protrudes as, as so and it looks like that till I finally found a picture that I wanted to put online. This is all we had. So what are you going to do if you see this besides swallow really hard, which I know I would do. We're going to put a sterile dressing over that. Or we're going to, we're going to uh, monitor the baby, support the baby and transport the baby. I'm phallocele, the abdominal wall, the muscles and the skin don't close and the peritoneal sac and the intestines are bulging from the abdomen. This is a very severe one. Sometimes you'll just see a little bitty bit of it. This one is big time. And they, they can fix this surgically. Uh, they, and it's in stages, so it takes a while to get that inside and to get that closed, but that is what you could see that also looks like this baby, they may have placed a, a ventricular shunt up here 
for hydrocephaly. So this little kid, this little kiddo had some problems during fetal development. Uh, the kid could end up doing all right. Uh, you just don't know. Uh, cover that with a sterile dressing and secure. Don't put tape. Don't put don't put a bunch of tape on baby skin. That skin will tear when they pull it off. It's like old man skin, but worse. So just put a sterile dressing over that. If you have some paper tape, it doesn't stick as tight as the silk tape. I always, we didn't, we didn't, our normal stock wasn't in any service I worked for, wasn't paper tape. It was always silk tape because it sticks better. But I always carried some paper tape with me for neonates and, and infants and old people. I bought it. It wasn't expensive, and I carried it for years and used it occasionally. And I'd buy a little bit more. Okay. Uh, that's That baby has a long road ahead of him. Twins, one out of 30 birth, births, your book says. One twin usually is larger than the other. Both should be probably smaller than a single birth, a single fetus. Um, I've never personally witnessed or delivered twins. Your book says about 10 minutes after the first birth, contractions kick back off and the birthing process will repeat itself. In a mother without prenatal care, then that could be a big surprise that contractions started back up. Scott Johnson, one of my my good paramedic friends that I worked with for years, and he's one of the guys I still stay in close contact with, had this exact thing. Delivered a baby in the back seat of a cab and did all that first five, ten minutes of care that you have to do. Got mom in the back of the ambulance and, and contractions fire up again. So he delivered one baby in the back of a cab and the other one, on the cot in his ambulance. I, I love hearing him tell that story too because he gets excited and animated when he talks. It's a lot of fun. Okay, still the same as delivering a baby and you're gonna require, record both birth times. You're gonna have th more, than, more than two PCRs. What if you deliver three kids? That's called triplets. Uh, you're gonna have four PCRs then, so you're always gonna have baby plus one PCR to do on this whole childbirth thing. Okay. Uh, twins quite often will just be really small and look premature. Or you'll have one normal size one, one little bitty one. And then there's a Bible story about twins being born and one of them having a, a red cord tied to his foot, I believe. Go look it up. Uh, premature birth delivery before eight months, which would be 32 weeks. 36 weeks is full gestation, so I call that premature, or if a baby weighs less than five pounds, which was me. Believe it or not, six foot six, 260 pounds right now, and I started life 58 years ago at five pounds. Not that you cared, but so I was considered a preemie. And I was less than 36 weeks gestation, too. Something that happens, if you're delivering a baby and it's less than 36 weeks gestation, I want you to keep your eye on something. Remember we talked about surfactant, and surfactant is what, back to the respiratory chapter, remember that surfactant is what helps keep alveoli inflated so that Every time someone exhales, the alveoli doesn't collapse and then have to be reinflated with every breath. Surfactant doesn't kick in in gestational age, gestational development until right at 36 weeks. If you're delivering a baby below 36 weeks, be prepared for that baby to have respiratory distress possibly even respiratory failure. For that reason, there's atelectasis. Every time they exhale, atelectasis, remember that means that the alveoli collapse. You gotta, if, 
that's a, another reason that we need to get the date of that last known menstrual period and we need to come up with the number of weeks since then because file that away what can I expect with this baby oh crap 32 weeks 33 weeks 35 weeks oh there's no surfactant those so I, so we're gonna have to get, use positive pressure ventilation to probably to uh, deal with that respiratory distress and you can explain to mom uh, baby's less than 36 weeks and there's some stuff that keeps keeps the little air sacs in the lungs inflated and there's not quite enough of it right now so we're just gonna we're just gonna help the baby breathe a little bit baby's breathing we're just helping some and and they'll explain all of it to you at the hospital you can expect that baby could end up on a ventilator at the hospital. Maybe not, we don't make that call, but but be ready to to assist ventilations on that baby less than 36 weeks gestation. And that's why. Okay. Uh, see, that one looks like a normal twin. That one looks like a normal baby. And except for, I don't know babies with hair because everybody in my family is born bald. And then we go back that way later, not the, not the chicks in our family, just the dudes. I had a, went to law school with a, with a lady and, and everything was, a, she was from New Jersey, everything was a dude or a chick. And one of our, one of our classmates was pregnant and she went into labor at, at the law school and drove herself to the hospital, wouldn't let anybody take her had the baby and in the next day we were standing in the hall talking before class and somebody said this this young woman had had her baby and the, the girl from New Jersey says do you have a dude baby or a chick baby so ever since that time I've, we have dude babies and chick babies in my mind I don't even remember my classmates name I just remember the, the dude baby chick baby thing but that's what a preemie looks like smaller size that's what a full-term baby looks like this baby can do just fine it's just it's just smaller but under five pounds would be classified as a preemie to, uh, regardless of the gestational age and would be managed accordingly uh longer than oh man past 40 weeks uh post-term pregnancies won't deliver, won't deliver, get to 42 weeks, got to get that baby out of there. Uh, gonna have to have induce or have a C-section. But you're going to have a baby who is extremely large, much larger than normal gestational age for a vaginal delivery. And there's a much higher likelihood of need for a C-section to get that baby here. Sometimes babies weigh more than 10 pounds. Uh, I witnessed I never delivered a baby that big, but I watched my baby being born when he weighed nine nine, and I don't know how you squeeze that that cantaloupe through the garden hose when he's ten pounds. He or she's ten pounds or more. We didn't we didn't roll the dice with our second one. We just had a C section with our daughter. She weighed nine two. I really hadn't noticed much difference in them other than Ben goes in and out through the door, and Maddie tends to like to use the window to go in. You get a little chuckle with that in class. But that was my, my law partner at the time. That's what he told me was the difference between a C-section and a vaginal delivery baby. Okay. Um, so those post-term, meaning past that 40 weeks, especially getting up there to 42 weeks, uh, increased chance of fetal delivery during Fetal injury during delivery, uh, thing sure increases the need for C-sections. Uh, high risk for large perineal tears resulting in bad infection. Uh, high, higher risk of meconium, meconium aspirate. Uh, fetal infection, that, that's usually going to be uh, a staph infection and then maybe even being stillborn, baby's dead. Fetal demise, uh, occasionally babies die in utero, not during the delivery process, but uh, baby dies in utero, and then 
it's more more of a miscarriage thing. Uh, just call it a stillbirth if it's at full term. Uh, if an interuterine infection, that would usually be a staph infection, just overwhel overwhelming infection that resulted in uh, that being transmitted to the baby and that caused fetal death, either interuterine infection or the infection to the baby caused fetal death. It can have a really foul odor. You can even deliver uh, one who's been dead so long that they've uh, started to uh, decompose and have a have that decomposition odor. I can't describe it, but you'll know what it is when you smell it. it whether it's uh, uh, neonate or whether it's uh, someone who's pretty ripe in their house in the middle of August without the air conditioner on. It's a bad thing. You know it before you open the door. You don't even have to have ever smelled it before. Okay, delivery without sterile supplies. Use clean sheets and towels. Send somebody to boil water. You ain't going to use it, but just have, if you need somebody to get them out of the way, just have them go boil water. That's in all the old westerns. I mean, they had to gather firewood, make a fire, get the water down at the creek, and put it on to boil, and the kid was ready to to run and throw a ball before the before they ever got the water boil, right? Uh, cut clamped cord, just like always. Uh, no, 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 do not. Okay, this is without sterile supplies. We're not going to cut and clamp the cord. Uh, and as soon as the placenta delivers, Wrap it in a clean towel and transfer. You're going to have a you're going to have an OB kit required by law. If you don't, find out where they where it is and make them get you one. Okay, even the fire trucks have OB kits. A lot of places, the police cars have OB kits, so. and they have radios so that we can get there with our OB kit. Bleeding continues. Do that uterine massage there on the fundus of the uterus. Remember the. Fundus is the most superior part, the top of the uterus, and it's just like your. And how many of us make bread by hand? I ain't never made bread by hand. It's like kneading bread. So if I were to knead bread, I'd say it's just like massaging your uterus. Circular motion, firm pressure. You're going to have to push deep. You're, deep. you're pushing past muscle. You're pushing deep down in there. Sometimes you use the heel of your hand down in there in a circular motion. That's where I start, okay? I uh, put a sterile pad over the vagina uh, and remember postpartum bleeding, if that, if that kiddo's in good enough shape, get that baby up there suckling to release that Pitocin to contract that uterus and help deal with that bleeding. Uh, during the whole labor process, Get mom on a nasal cannula at two, two to four liters per minute. It's going to help her with everything, I promise. Uh, monitor vital signs. So after delivery, and if mom is bleeding a lot, forget the, the nasal cannula, not a rebreather mass, 15 liters per minute. During, uh, during labor, uh, throw that, throw two liters a minute or four liters a minute of O2 on mom. There's a, there's a placebo effect that mom thinks you're doing something and thinks that oxygen's helping, therefore it does. And then there is also a therapeutic effect by increasing mom's uh, O2 sat. There is a risk of a postpartum embolism. Uh, it's most of the time it's going, it, it can, okay, there's two ways. There can be just a regular thromboembolism that forms like a, a deep vein thrombosis that breaks loose from the legs and goes up and goes through the right side of the heart and out the pulmonary artery and you have a pulmonary embolism. I don't understand this one. I don't know how this happens, but there is also a risk of an amniotic fluid embolism. What I don't know is how the amniotic fluid gets into venous circulation. I'm sure I could look it up and there's an explanation. 
and I have Harrison's internal medicine book that they use in medical school sitting out here on my bookshelf and I can look it up, but it's never that big a deal. So every semester I say, I don't know how it gets there, but there's amniotic fluid getting in venous circulation and it, it can go through. All right. So, so how do you know it's there? Oh, your patient will let you know sudden onset of difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, either during or following delivery. That can be a pulmonary embolism. How do we treat that? Do we remember? It's been a long time ago. We're not in class, so I can make you tell me. So non-rebreather mask uh, and place the patient's head at, a, at about a 45 degree angle on your cot and Q5 minute vital signs, high flow oxygen, uh, assist ventilations if needed, call ALS, rapid transport. Uh, who, whether they're gonna get to you first or you're gonna get to the hospital first, depending on how far away AL, ALS is, we need to get them to a hospital like right 10 minutes ago before it happened. But, okay, questions, man, what a day. We can't do environmental emergencies in 30 minutes, but the, I have the video out there. Watch it. Uh, if you have any questions, holler at me. Uh, you'll get what you need there.